Well, good afternoon, financial professionals. My name is John Florence, and I'm Senior Vice President of Marketing here at E4 Insurance Services. And I'm welcoming you to The Brew, building relationships every week. Thanks for tuning in today. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. As is our tradition, we like to start the Brewcast by celebrating a few of today's national days. Today is National Shoe the World Day, which reminds you that not everybody is as fortunate as my wife. Search out a shoe charity near you and help protect the bare feet that trod our planet. Today is also National Everything You Think is Wrong Day. This is an opportunity for you to stop and consider whether your strongest held opinions might not be as correct as you actually think they are. And lastly, today is National Pears Helene Day. Pretty certain I have never eaten Pears Helene, but they must be amazing if there's a national day for them. So try them out. I will say there's no such thing as National Strawberries Pavlova Day, and that's my favorite dessert. So Pears Helene must be awesome. On today's brew, we welcome back Daniel Davies, Regional Vice President at Prudential. Dan is going to be revisiting the private placement life insurance market with us. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you to please feel free to use the chat box to share your thoughts and ask questions. Also, all attendees are in a drawing for a continuing education voucher and a Starbucks gift card, and we will be announcing today's winner at the end of the program. Dan, welcome back to The Brew. Last time, you gave us a very comprehensive overview of the PPLI solution and opportunity. Since you were here last, at least with many of the advisors that I talked to, there's been a lot of concerns related to global markets and inflation and interest rates, and most recently, some volatility in the banking sector. If you would, please remind our audience about what PPLI is and who takes advantage of these kinds of solutions, and then please share if in any way, these recent developments are changing or impacting the PPLI space as you see it. Dan, welcome back, and I'll give you the floor. Thank you, John. Um, thanks, everybody. So uh, today we'll we'll cover what's happening in the PPLI market. I, I think I'll start off just by indicating that the, you know, the PPLI market really is focused here on a long-term uh, insurance-driven solution. Um, and while we'll see fluctuations in the short terms, et cetera, um, we really don't see a lot of the, the news and so forth over the last month or six months really impacting how the solution works, uh, it, how it operates. It's really taking advantage of the existing life insurance laws that provide cash value buildup. And um, we uh, we continue to march on. You know, the bigger impact to the space really is related to the tax environment and the long-term tax environment related to income taxes on alternative investments and uh, other investments that are less efficient for ultra-high net worth clients. And those will be the bigger factors that really drive the interest and, and um, opportunity in the space. So, uh, so with that, um, John, any questions before I step into a quick overview and some of the features of the solution? No, I, I, I appreciate that uh, contextualization. And yeah, why don't you go ahead and talk to us again about what PPLI is all about and maybe where some of the opportunities lie for our advisors. So uh, again, let's talk about what PPLI is. Um, and let me start off by indicating that, uh, you know, PPLI is really just taking advantage of the existing insurance um, uh, IRS regulations and, um, and then adding to that some unique investments that are uh, targeted towards ultra high net worth clients and towards non-correlated type assets. So again, the insurance um, codes that, that we're all very familiar with here, the 
code 101A 7702 uh, build up 7702 and, and then IRC uh, 72 related around the tax free benefits of uh, pulling out uh, loans uh, up to withdrawals up to basis and, and loans in a favorable fashion. So those things are all available on all the accumulation products we're familiar with. Again, life insurance uh, uh, death benefit tax free. Um, and no, no changes there, but just to highlight that. So PPLI really starts to make its difference um, here in terms of its design. Um, you know, we see the traditional design on the on the left here with the emphasis on the death benefit. And PPLI is really driven about driven around minimizing death benefit, increasing the um, cash value of the account. So we see that in other products, but PPLI is really focused on that. Um, so again, the key here with the PPLI emphasis is the alternative investments. That's really the, uh, the key focus here. And that is really the pivot point of where you have clients decide whether PPLI is of interest or not. Now, again, as I indicated at the start of the conversation here today, you know, PPLI uh, is really about the efficiency uh, of the solution, but taking advantage and, and giving an alternative to these clients around the tax environment. So tax environment from 2012 to 2021, Hey, we're all pretty familiar with it, whether it's ordinary income, capital gains, or dividends. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to take a, for this hypothetical, you're going to take a gross investment return of 8%. And what is really the take home? What's the net that the client is bringing home on a relatively inefficient uh, strategy? And so it's probably going to be around 50%, depending upon the state income taxes as well. So that's a pretty big hit. So what's PPLI about? Well, PPLI is very clean, and it's about uh, eliminating the taxes that are uh, handled and, 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 uh, and that are taken out of the brokerage type accounts. And using those tax inefficient strategies inside of an insurance contract and really changing that net from 4% on an 8% gross to something closer to 7% plus. So you're trading off the taxes for the cost of the structure. And in this scenario, PPLI cost structure, 80 basis points or in that range. And here's a quick comparison of what you're looking at with it. The, the taxable portfolio, netting out around 4% on an 8% return, whereas the PPLI uh, netting out 320 basis points higher, substantial uh, mathematical advantage here. So really we're talking about people who are insurable, who can really take advantage of this and are accredited investor qualified purchasers. So ultra high net worth clients. While that AIQP uh, uh, guideline uh, is, is north of a 5 million net worth, um, you know, most clients who get into this space are probably north of a $25 million net worth. Um, this is what your typical design looks like. So any of us are familiar with the cash value buildup of the insurance structure. The lower number would be a comparable uh, taxable account. The PPUL cash surrender value, that middle brown uh, line on the graph. And then we bring that death benefit. The blue line is close to the cash value um, you know, being considered of the non-MEC uh, insurance guidelines, which we follow as well. 
Now, that being said, you can do MAC designs in this solution, just like traditional uh, cash value products. Um, and in some cases, the MAC designs are, um, are efficient for the clients who don't need access to the cash value. So here's a few things that differ with the PPLI besides the investment options. Um, obviously, on one side of the transaction, you have the policy holder, policy owner. Uh, you have the producer who is typically uh, going to be either a Series 7 or 663 variable license producer with a broker dealer who has approved the PPLI product. And then obviously the carrier with credential on the far right. And then the, the differentiation here is the investments. We refer to the investment options for PPLI as insurance dedicated funds. These are funds that have already been um, brought to the platform over the last 20 years um, and that uh, offer these unique strategies for these clients. Um, a second strategy uh, that has come about the last two years is um, what we refer to as an MSA managed separate account. The managed separate account is, a, um, is an option that allows larger RIAs to actually manage a, a discretionary account portfolio uh, for their clients in the private placement life policy. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but that has opened up a lot of uh, synergies between variable licensed insurance brokers, broker dealers, and these large RIAs uh, that, um, that really see this as an enhancement to their uh, investment management practices. The, uh, the process flow, real high level here is left to right. You have the policy owner who's an AIQP, obviously working with an agent, credential as a carrier. We do do 65 million of auto buying on these solutions. They represent high premiums. The premiums start at a million, but they average two to 10 million in premium in these solutions. And um, so the 65 million auto buying makes things relatively streamlined for us. If we have to go above that, we can go out to our reinsurers and get up to about 110 million in capacity. Uh, these are segregated accounts uh, with the uh, carrier. And then the investment options, here's the big difference. IDFs, which are these insurance dedicated funds, these alternatives out there. MSAs, managed separate accounts. Those are the solutions offered by RIAs. And again, let me clarify, these RIAs are brought to us and have to go through a due diligence process with Prudential to get on board. The VITs, uh, we have that out there. We do have registered funds, VITs available, but um, uh, this represents a smaller percentage of allocation to the PPLS solution. And then we have the fixed account that is an option too. Um, I'm going to move through a few of these other slides rather quickly so we can um, focus on really the highlights, address any Q&As, and, and, and uh, wrap up here and use our time as wisely as possible. So again, proper design, non-MAC, you know, we're looking at the uh, 7702 um, uh, compatibility. And um, everything here is pretty uh, well known. I think the two key things are these lower bullets, low institutional cost, transparent pricing structure. So the pricing on the PPLI and the structure, when you look at these illustrations, it's transparent. And the other piece is these investments, sometimes when these types of investments are, are owned in brokerage accounts, they do have K1s associated with them. So when we offer these investments um, in the PPLI, the K1s um, uh, are, not, uh, um, are not part of what the client has to take care of. So we eliminate the K1 reporting for them. Again, a quick, uh, a quick comparison of the private placement advantages relative to the same types of, of um, assets invested in the brokerage account. And I'll let that slide speak for itself. 
And again, we can get this slide presentation to anyone um, on the uh, on the call here that uh, wants to uh, wants to have it to look at it in more detail. Okay, so uh, let me finish up here with with uh, key opportunities here. So again, we're we're going to talk about people who are insurable, ultra high net worth clients, have a portion of their portfolio or interest in alternative investments. Um, a lot of these clients may be liquidity events, already pre-funded trust, looking at gifting options, um, 1035 opportunities out of existing insurance policies that they may be underperforming. Um, again, we're seeing some executives do this on a, a, a small uh, group basis, but each case does have to be individually underwritten in contrast to some type of Coley type or, or Bowley type programs that are out there that have a simplified issue uh, program. And we do do term conversions on uh, PPLI. And so we're really talking about the access and expanding markets within family offices, large RIAs, uh, law firms, CPAs, trust offices, all very strong proponents of the solution because it is transparent. It's very efficient, it's priced very low, um, and uh, it provides a lot of value for what is um, what are the other alternatives that are out there. And I think we talked about this already, right, CPAs. Um, and I think, I think the thing I'll focus on here is we've seen a lot of growth from larger RIAs over the last um, 18 months. And for smaller RAs, they can get involved in this space. Uh, typically, what we do is we will talk to them and maybe connect them with a larger RA who's already on the platform. And sometimes those synergies can work out for him. They're all trying that with clients as well. Last thing I'll finish here is just uh, Prudential's uh, differentiation in the market. Again, our footprint in, in underwriting, capacity, um, uh, we retain 10 million and the pricing of our product is, uh, is extremely competitive in the uh, private placement space. So I'll finish with that and I'm going to um, exit our deck here and see if we have some questions to address and then turn it back over to John. Dan, thank you so much for that share, and we certainly appreciate the information. A couple of questions that I have, just um, you know, for clarification for myself: Do you does Prudential track the average return on all policies? I mean, understanding that you have individual money managers, I'm assuming it would probably be greater than eight percent, especially something like the MSA strategy that you were showing. Yeah, so um, we do not. Uh, we do not track the um, any kind of aggregate, but the uh, track record of the the performance track record of the IDFs um, and the separate accounts as they come on board is available. Um, the IDFs is available through a platform called Sally Separate Account Life Insurance, which is a large administrator in this space, and they actually have a portal that is. Uh, uh, that is open to um, to advisors and to the clients to go out there and take a look. Prudential is going to be launching in the next 60 days um, a PPLI portal. So clients, advisors, and, and uh, individuals who um, have, uh, have signed on for authority on, on reviewing and servicing policies can go out there and see these policies and their performance. Awesome. Um, with the changes uh, in past months on 7702, has that had any meaningful impact on PPLI in the marketplace there? Yeah, the, the, those changes, uh, what, 1-1 one, one and 21, um, they, yeah. they really enhanced, obviously, the, the amount of cash you could get in non-net contracts. And um, and actually, they, they also enhanced the amount that premium you could get for a MEC contract. So, so they did add a little bit of performance to the solution. Um, and in some cases more meaningful than others, but but definitely a little bit of a of a uh, uh, 
an input or an, an a, uh, increase to the momentum in the market. That's awesome. Um, I have a couple of questions that have popped up in my chat box um, from one attendee, just so that we know what's possible. What is the biggest premium that you have had on one of these types of <laughs> policies? You can share that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, interesting. So if we look at it from a MEC design, so sometimes there, there are scenarios where the client does not need access to the, to the um, cash values. Um, so you can run a pretty favorable MEC design. In other words, put a lot of premium in for relatively low death benefit. You know, what probably comes to mind is um, maybe a $15, $20 million single pay. Uh, buying 30 to 40 million of insurance um, on a relatively young life. Um, <laughs> so uh, as a single pay, uh, you know, that, those are probably on the higher end of the numbers on the MEC design. On non-MEC, we'll see, um, uh, you know, again, young, a, a, a younger life, uh, get a lot more time to accumulate, but probably a one to three million a year premium for four years is gonna be, um, uh, is gonna get close to filling capacity on an older life. We, we've seen from four to $6 million a year for three to five years. Um, so total of maybe 20 million a premium on an older life. To fund um, uh, to fund one of these and use a lot of the capacity in the marketplace. Oh, that we all had a half a dozen or so of those clients in our back yeah. pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if there's other questions here. And while we're waiting to see if there are final questions, I'd like to remind you that today's brew and our entire library of brew casts have been recorded and shared on the Blue Brew blog on our website at www.e4.insurance, as well as on our YouTube channel dedicated. And you can find that by just searching in Google at E4 Insurance YouTube. Uh, let's see. Okay, here's one more, actually two more questions. If we use the fixed account, could PPLI done, be done in conjunction with premium finance funding? Do you see that at all? Um, no, it's a variable product. We don't. Um, we really don't go into the premium finance with the, with this solution. Okay, and then uh, I think this is the most important question of the day. Probably, would owning a PPLI policy help me be more popular at the bar? <laughs> <laughs> Probably you have some implications related around your net worth, right? <laughs> Might have a few implications. <clears throat> Very good. Well, now for our giveaway. Dan, if you would, please pick a number between 1 and 25. Oh, how about 13? And 13. Our winner today is Jim Kindred. So Jim, thanks for attending today and Congratulations, and please be on the lookout for a complimentary continuing education voucher and a Starbucks gift card, courtesy of E4 Insurance Services. Finally today, do you find yourself hopelessly confused about indexed annuity crediting strategies? Do you find it difficult to explain 300% participation rates? Are you baffled by a 90% cap with a 1% spread on an excess return two-year point-to-point global H-factor index? If you answered yes to any of those questions, be sure to join us next week as we welcome Dana Parks, Director of Fixed Annuity Product Development at Nationwide. Dana will help clear the air by breaking down the pricing structures, strategies, and options behind these allocations and explain how they prepare for future renewal rates. We'll see you again next week on The Brew. And Dan, once again, thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon.